Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, uh, thank you all for coming. I'm going to just start a minute early here. Um, and uh, I, I hope you all had like a good day. I had a great day. I learned a lot. Um, and I'm excited to share with you some of the stuff I've learned um, at my company and um, uh, some of the problems we've, we've faced and we've had to solve. Um, if I had to rename this presentation another name, I would rename it um, The Quest for the Golden Pipeline or maybe The Search for True Security. Uh, but it was all started from the idea of using OCI and GitOps together. Um, before I start, I just was curious, um, how, how many of you know what OCI is or the Open Container Initiative? Could you raise your hand? Okay, yeah, a few of you. Uh, okay, cool. Um, a, a little bit about me first. I am a software develop, uh, sorry, I am a developer relations engineer at Harness. Um, uh, these are, those are my socials. Uh, I said software development engineer because that's what I used to be. Um, as recent as like a few months ago. Uh, I've been in the DevOps industry for about five years. I was a part of Pivotal, uh, building PKS, then VMware Tanzu, then JFrog um, on their integrations team, and now I'm working at Harness. And so I've got a chance to see a lot of DevOps and a lot of things, and I liked learning and talking about them, and so now I'm here today. So. What I'm talking today about today is um, a play of sorts. It's a quest, um, a story we learned throughout our uh, deployment journey at Harness um, to figure out um, what, like, to figure out what we were doing. Uh, <laughs> and the quest was the quest for secure software, and specifically, the quest was through trusted delivery. Um, trusted delivery is an idea, uh, a met methodology. Um, that ensures security, integrity, and reliability of applications. Um, and because we are a DevOps platform, uh, we are a common point of attack for um, attackers. Uh, people will want to get in through us. I feel, I think just last year, JFrog Artifactory was attacked, leading to a vulnerability in Microsoft. So we want trusted delivery, um, and that means security. Verifying the authenticity and integrity of an application's source code, dependencies, and artifacts, and crucially, its configurations. Um, another tenet of trusted delivery is policy as code. Uh, we want to codify and enforce rules for infrastructure, security, um, and thereby reducing or eliminating human errors. Uh, policies can include security, resilience, and coding standards, and usually they're implemented through high-level languages to control, uh, manage, and automate those policies. Um, trusted delivery is a DevSecOps approach. Uh, we want to align with the DevSecOps methodology, um, which is integrating security into every stage of software development lifecycle, um, ensuring that the security considerations are not just an afterthought, but, an embedded, but are embedded from the outset. Uh, this enables early detection and early resolution of potential security issues. This is shift left that we've seen in the last few years. Uh, and lastly, another major tenant we focused on was focus on compliance. Uh, we wanted trusted delivery systems to uh, we, uh, emphasize adhering to regulatory standards and best practices, um, such as those provided by the government, um, the open source community, or um, a compliance team in the company itself. Um, importantly, we did not want this to hinder development uh, progress. We still wanted to continue to deploy quickly, um, and that was one of the major struggles we had. So this approach ensures uh, when you're doing focus on compliance that your applications are compliant with the necessary security standards throughout the entire life cycle. So that's act one, that's our quest. Uh, what are our heroes? Uh, for us, uh, it was OCI and GitOps were two of the main heroes that we wanna focus on. Um, to start, let's talk a little bit about OCI, the Open Container Initiative. Um, the Open Container Initiative is an open governance structure. Uh, its purpose is to create an open industry standards around container formats, runtimes, and distributions. Uh, importantly, it's lightweight. It's a lightweight governance structure. It's meant to easily slot into your existing deployments or um, like platforms. Uh, right now, they have three container um, uh, formats or runtimes, uh, specifications, I should say. Uh, one is the runtime specification or the runtime spec. 
One is the image specification or the image spec, and the last one is the distribution specification. Um, an example of a high-level OCI implementation would look like you would download an OCI image and unpack that image into an OCI runtime or file system bundle. And at that point, the runtime bundle would be run by the OCI runtime. Um, the OCI is, is open, and they wanted to keep it simple. So an example of that is uh, they, one of the major standards they enforce is that if you should be similar to your other containerized environments that you know and the other ways that you run containers. For example, they don't want to change the idea that you can just run an image with a Docker run and the image name or a RKT run and then the image name. Uh, it should support that user experience. Uh, that is a, like a one big example of an OCI standard. Uh, and the goal of doing this is to create trust. The hope is that open standards and transparency, knowing exactly how these images are um, certified and signed and or how they're built, uh, will create trust in the image itself. Um, and that's, that's amazing. Uh, that has helped a lot. Uh, but when we started using OCI images, we found that we didn't want to deal with a lot of the actual deployment of it. We didn't want to deal with how the runtime would run or how we would like change the state in our cluster on the, based on a new image. Uh, we kind of just wanted to declare an image and use OCI as our source of truth and then have our um, like cloud state change depending on that, which sounds really similar uh, to GitOps. Uh, GitOps is using Git as a source of truth and using pull requests to change your state. Um, it's declarative. Uh, and so we thought, well, what if we use Argo CD as a part of this? Um, Argo CD, as you all probably know, is declarative GitOps continuous delivery tool. We won't talk too much about that. But for trusted delivery scenarios, we wanted to use OCI repositories and OCI images. Uh, we looked into it. Um, it's kind of like putting a square peg into a round hole. Argo CD is specifically made for Git, but we're not the only ones who are looking for it. There was community support for OCI images. Uh, a few GitHub repos out there have been made. And um, there's a proposal. Uh, actually, as, as uh, recent as this year, I think in February, a proposal was merged uh, to Argo CD to add OCI as like a native support for Argo CD. But that's gonna take some time, and currently the configuration was tricky. Uh, and confusing. But we figured we could solve this with automation and pipeline tools and the mythical golden pipeline, which I'll get to in a second. Um, GitOps for us uh, was a very useful tool. Uh, we ended up not using it for all of our um, deployments, but a few of our uh, modules and features. Um, and it's because it has a few villains and vulnerabilities. Um, uh, some of the GitOps security risks are the risks involved with Git. Um, a lot of them are Git security risks involved for a lot of different deployment strategies, but I'll just run through a few of them. For example, uh, malware injection into Git repositories, uh, improper storage of secrets or other sensitive information. Because it's all stored in Git uh, and it's all stored as code, any sensitive information or secret needs to be encrypted before it goes into the Git repository. And that is um, something that, as developers, we should all do. But it's also something that can be messed up or um, that, can be, that can become a problem due to human error. Um, another uh, issue you can have with Git or, or GitOps is unauthorized access to a GitOps workflow step. It can mean unauthorized access to the whole workflow depending on how it's set up. Improperly configured deployment manifests, if they're pulled and merged into GitOps, you know, they will, the, you'll have an in, uh, insecure deployment in production uh, almost immediately. So we build tests and stuff for that, but it, it's, it's just an issue with Git. And then finally, a, a final problem is that packages themselves are vulnerable. They can have issues, they can have code like attached to them. Um, SolarWinds attack was an example of something like that. Um, and that's an issue uh, on the, the broad scale. That's what OCI helps solve. So we wanna put these two together. And to do that, we used the Golden Pipeline. 
Uh, the Golden Pipeline was a mythical ideal. Uh, it's the dream that the code will be uh, submitted by the developer and that two hours from now it'll be live in uh, production. And we're, we're getting closer to it every, every single day. Um, part of our Golden Pipeline uh, was uh, automating end-to-end -end with Argo CD and OCI. Uh, Integrating pipelines, um, integrating our pipelines with Argo CD managed workloads help us uh, do a lot of things. Uh, one of those was that it, it was allowed us to build, test, verify, and deploy the software all at once. And extending Argo CD in that way um, kind of removed some of the problems we had with it. Uh, for, for example, um, we had OCI images that we were building, uh, scan, building, and testing. Uh, and we would upload them to our own artifact repo, and we would know that when they got into that repo, they were safe. Um, but we wanted that to be the update trigger for our GitOps workflows, and so we built automation around it. We built a, uh, a pipeline that would see the artifact um, and create a PR um, against our Git repo and change the configuration. Uh, we uh, did a lot of these things, uh, and we got close to this, uh, this golden pipeline. Um, at Harness, we had like four production clusters, two QA, two dev clusters, uh, and we successfully ended up deploying using OCI and GitOps and pipelines. Uh, we, we found that uh, we, by tracking versions, uh, yeah, we successfully uh, did all that. And it worked. We went from one to two deployments uh, in the last year to about uh, a release every week. Uh, and that release train doesn't stop. Um, it goes and it goes and goes, and it, we're really proud of it. And we're trying to improve it anymore so we can do multiple releases in a week. Uh, one of the benefits of this like style of pipeline that we've created is that we get the, the bonuses of both um, a like, Git repository and a safe image. So we can track versions in the Git repository uh, and releasing config images. And we can also get the version control of it uh, and immutable infrastructure of an image itself. Uh, you can change a Git commit, but you can't change the SHA on an image. Well, hopefully you can't change it. <laughs> um, yeah, and so we, we, we found problems early. Uh, as we were building out this pipeline, we found out that uh, we found issues, we fixed them. We found code errors and we fixed them. Uh, and it was working. But that was a few years ago. Uh, that was when we, like as an industry, were trying to shift left. That was when we said security should be a part of the whole process. Um, and we were finding issues early. But now we're running into some new problems. Some deployments would fail after, uh, after what we would, we would think that they were acceptable, but then we'd start to get metrics from Datadog or Prometheus that would say that, oh, wait, there's actually an error here for some long-lived thing. And we needed to continuously verify these, these issues. Um, we would find that we would get security issues. We would, we would know of them. But fixing them and finding and solving them would take longer than we wanted. Uh, some, fixing some of these issues would slow down our releases and we wouldn't get to that dream once a week release scenario. Um, I've never seen a pipeline that has never failed. Uh, and so our pipelines still occasionally fail. Um, and we would fix them. We would, get, uh, we would understand how they uh, failed. An experienced developer would be able to fix them pretty quickly, someone who's been on the team for a while. But for newer developers who don't have the context or the knowledge or the in-company um, experience, we're taking longer than uh, we wanted to fix some of these issues. And, and finally, uh, another example of an issue we'd had is that we would find a CVE in an image or an image we built, and we would say, oh, it's this CVE tag, and then we'd have to take time to look up the CVE, figure out what it was, figure out how it was broken, and figure out how to actually fix it in our code. Um, all that information is out there, we just had to gather it, like, like generate it, and uh, put it together. And from that, we realized that there was another solution, uh, that there's something out there that can help us, a secret hero, if you will, uh, 
Uh, and I know we're not the only ones who notice this, because uh, someone had a presentation on this earlier today. Uh, but remediation, after you find issues, can be done with AI. Uh, AI was integral in getting us to that reliable, once-a-week uh, deployment process. Uh, it's all AI, and, it's, and now it always will be. <laughs> AI has changed the game. It's changed how we think about uh, the world and about code. Um, and so, for example, uh, we made a, uh, an AI machine learning program uh, in our continuous verification steps. We would get data, previous data, from the previous deployment, we would look at it and we would say, OK, uh, we would learn on it and say, OK, how many times has this been failing? Uh, how many, what's our baseline? What have we deemed as acceptable in the past because this deployment has lived for a few weeks? Um, and we want to compare it to that level. We want that to be our new standard. And I don't want to have to uh, manually maintain or establish standards from our metrics to say that this is what we say is, is good. So our, our AI will look at our old deployment. And when our new one comes in, it'll continuously verify it. And if it fails, it'll do an automatic rollback. With that, we added some new things. We could change the sensitivity on that for the machine learning. And doing all of this made us so that we could trust our deployments a lot more. We knew that if something failed, we wouldn't have to wake up or get paged in the middle of the night to fix it, because it would roll back automatically. And we trusted the, uh, the AI enough through our tests that we knew that it would, it would properly understand when to make these changes. Uh, another example, and a personal favor of mine when I was helping out on this team, uh, is, and like I'm playing around with this, is uh, generative AI. Um, our pipelines would generate errors uh, and our, that we would have to go search in our documentation uh, and find and fix. Sometimes the error would be amalgamation of things that require us to find um, information at multiple points in the documentation, uh, and it, it would be difficult. But we figured that this was a prime use case for like ChatGPT style generative AI. We took a generative AI and we trained it on our um, documentation that all our tech writers use, uh, write for us. Uh, and we found that it gives us amazing results. Uh, anytime an, a pipeline gives an error or generates an error, uh, Ida, uh, which is our AI's name, will be there to generate a, uh, a root cause analysis. It'll tell you what happened, why it think it failed, and uh, if you so want, it'll allow you to generate a possible solution or remediation. Right there in the pipeline, you can go in, change the ML, change a setting, or change the code depending on what the problem was. Um, it, it, it provides actionable next steps, and it, it shortened down the amount of time it took to fix our broken pipelines um, measurably. Um, because searching through documentation takes time, I guess. And finally, uh, we had vulnerability remedi remediation. Uh, we had a lot of code, uh, and sometimes the code would we would find a CVE in it. We would find that something we had written uh, was vulnerable uh, using a scanning tool such as SonarCube, uh, et cetera. But like I said before, actually finding the solution to that was incredibly difficult. Um, well, it was difficult. It took time. Um, now we have an AI that will search. Uh, it'll, once it sees a CVE, it'll tell you where in the code that CVE is coming from. And it'll offer a code solution uh, for you to try and use uh, to see if that'll work and it'll fix your problem. Uh, vulnerability remediation in this way uh, was, uh, was integral and in so that when we actually came to deploying our software, it failed less due to security issues because the developers would have already found it and fixed it before they committed their code. Um, those are just like three examples of how we've used AI in a development process. And going back to um, this golden pipeline slide, uh, we now think of automation as not just a pipeline, not just a like path to production, but an intelligent, ever-evolving um, like system that is helping us deploy our product. Uh, when it comes back to GitOps and OCI, um, our images are automatically scanned, uh, and our uh, everything is uh, is insured safely 
with our AI tools. Uh, that is um, that is all I have for you today. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. I think we have about five minutes um, for them. Uh, but if you want to talk more about this, I will also be at CDCon and OSS Summit tomorrow, as well as a lot of uh, people on our team. Um, and I'll also be outside the conference room. But if anyone has any questions, please uh, let me know. Okay, thank you. <laughs>